Hello and welcome to this INI Builds video. What are we going to be covering today? Well, it's going to be the long-awaited A300 version 2 update. But before we get into the features today, let's talk about where this video is going to take place. We're going to be at the Victorville Airport, which is located in Southern California in the Victor Valley. The airport used to be the George Air Force Base, but this was closed in 1992 and the US government tried to turn the airport into a profitable center for the locals and they did this by transforming it into an aircraft graveyard recycling and quite a few test flights go along at this airport as well. It's got one of the longest runways in the world, like over 15,000 feet, so over 4,700 meters. I believe it's the second longest public use runway in the United States, so it's huge. Uh, also, out of interest for you, you have General Electric have a test aircraft that they do test flights from here. And also, they recently flew down the 747-8i to be converted to the next Air Force One, and that's done at this airbase here. Also, during the pandemic, it's become a location for storing a huge amount of airliners because of its excess space and very long runways, because you can get anything in and out of this airport, literally any plane on the planet. And in late March 2020, there's about 275 airliners were being stored at this airport, and quite a few of them still remain to this day. So what are we going to cover in today's video? First of all, we're going to go over the 3D changes to the A300 version 2 on the outside and the inside and show off the new cargo interior. Then we're going to show off that some night lighting as well with the cargo interior. Then we're going to take a closer look at the flight deck, the 3D changes, the texture changes and just some of the enhancements. Some of them you would have seen on the A310 but I'm just going to go over a few of them again for people coming back for the A300 version 2. We're going to take a quick look then at the EFB and we're going to take a look at the new settings we have in there, the IDC and the auto save functionality. Again, same as the 310, but we're going to go over it. Then we're going to taxi out and we're going to do a takeoff at quite a heavy weight uh, from this massive runway at a very hot temperature. And then we're going to talk about the flight model and the improvements that have been made in that area. We also may end up doing a very short test flight and showing you some of these failures. So without further ado, Let's get on with the video. So what have we done to change on the exterior 3D for the A300 version 2? Well, we've brought it in line with the A310. So we've taken across the General Electric and Pratt & Whitney engines. The Pratt & Whitney engine was a brand new 3D model for the A310, including UV mapping, textures, all this sort of stuff. And the General Electric engine was upgraded and that's also been brought across. Next, we could have also brought in this oil canning effect. Now, what is this? Well, near the front of the aircraft, where the fuselage kind of comes to a point, obviously for the flight deck, you generally get sort of expansion and contraction when you go through some pressure cycles, and it causes this sort of rippled effect between the main structure of the aircraft. You can also see this on, say, A320 family aircraft, but it's a lot rarer just because they're not as old. But we've brought this effect in for the A300 version 2, and I, I really like it. We've also kept the really high quality um, decals on the exterior. They were there for the version 1, but they've been upgraded and even added to in some areas as well. So you can really read and see all of the text across the aircraft and the whole airframe. I really like it if you do a virtual walk around. Moving to the rear of the aircraft, what do we do in this area? Well, we adjusted the fuse large length. We also then moved on to the tail. So we've made this sure that this trimmable horizontal stabilizer is fully animated and moves up and down just like you would on the 310 and redone this area around here. And also up on the tail, we've also redone some of the 3D in that area. You can also see that there's a lot more wear on this airframe. Now, what we wanted to go for on the exterior of this was kind of a bit more wear and tear. Now, a lot of different liveries will either be relatively clean or very, very worn, even more worn than you've seen here on spinners and radomes and things like this, because some of these aircraft that are flying around are in a terrible state <laughs> in real life. You know, often you'll see some damage to parts of the aircraft, things like this, you know, dinks and dents and all this sort of stuff. And they fly around like that daily because just some of them are getting near 30, 40 years old and they've been a hard 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 life but so we thought we would give some of the repainters options for this so you'll see it across the 
scope but the default white livery here it's kind of a balance it's worn but not too worn but somewhere in the middle moving back to the front of the aircraft you can also see how we've redone the 3D on the nose of the aircraft. I would describe it as looking a bit more angular. Uh, I just think it looks better overall in this area. On top of this, we've also retextured the entire airframe and re-UV mapped it, so it's going to be easier to paint for people who want to do that. And also, overall, it just looks just a lot better. And that really wraps up the changes for the 3Ds and the texturing on the exterior of the aircraft. So let's move on to the interior cargo 3D and texturing. So now you join us on the interior of the A300 version two freighter. Now, what has changed in here? Quite a bit, as you can see. What we've done is we've taken out those pseudo two cargo units that we had. So the, the ULDs, I believe they're called and we've extended the 3D all the way to the back of the aircraft. Now I think this looks really, really good. It gives a real unique view and you really can appreciate the size of the A300. It's a really big cargo plane, really, really wide, significantly wider than the 767 and obviously vastly wider than the narrow bodied 757. And that's why it's in service to this day if I I have to give an opinion on it is it just has that extra real wide body width with reasonably good operating costs reasonably good not compared to very modern types but it's been around forever and it really really can get the job done now also what we've done in this area is we've put dynamic lighting with textures that also mean that you don't get a massive performance hit if you want to fly this at night with all the lights on which i think it just looks great like this at night now, obviously, we've still got the interactive 3D panel. This is the same as the version one, but all the functionality has been kept there. So the door can go to 75 or 145 degrees as per the real aircraft, depending on what you're loading in. What we're going to look at after this is the fact that you can physically load the 3D cargo containers into this area, send the tug away, and they will remain in flight. You can't load one or three. You can only load the same amount each time but I still think it's a really, really cool feature to be able to load. And then on arrival, you can unload these because that was a requested feature because it really feels like you're carrying cargo from one place to another, just like we brought in on the Beluga. So we've built upon that in the A300 version two. We've also got the courier area as it's called, and this is effectively just for currying people. So carrying people back and forth between different maintenance bases. This has not really changed all that much from the A300 version one. So without further ado, let's move on to the 3D loading and move into the flight deck. So the way we load cargo is a new system on the A300 version two, kind of similar to the Beluga, as we mentioned before. So what you do is you go onto the EFB, you request the loader, the loader will now drive up to the aircraft and it will stop. You then have to select load cargo. The cargo will then load on piece by piece. All four pieces of cargo will load onto the aircraft and you'll notice that the button is greyed out for removing the loader until the cargo has loaded onto the aircraft. Now, the cool thing is, as you can see, each piece is loading. Once the loading process has completely finished you can click remove loader or if you'd arrived at an, air, at an airport with cargo on board you will be able to click the unload option and the cargo will come off the aircraft as if it was loaded on so basically the reverse of what we're seeing now it's a really cool option because when you're flying around you can look in the back and you can see cargo loaded on but if you do an empty positioning flight which is actually quite common with um, DHL and a few other cargo carriers where you position somewhere empty you can do that as well and have an empty cargo bay so it's kind of simulating the operation that you're doing it's another neat little feature um, like i say comes across from when we did on the beluga but now let's move on to the next section so what has changed in the flight deck at first glance it might look quite similar but overall there's been a lot of changes a lot of them have come across directly from the a310 so the window frame sort of where the handle is 3d and texturing is all new the texturing across the entire flight deck is new as well to a higher standard a bit more sort of refinement on the ambient occlusion sort of the baking and the textures are higher quality just about everywhere 
Also, we brought across that really, really nice effect that when all the switches are off, you can still read on the switch what it says. All the Airbus buttons are like this, even in the 320. So if you just look at them with no power on, you can see off or off R or whatever they're supposed to be. And that effect is brought across to the A300. So added in the compass from the A310, which you can see is activated by pushing the CVR microphone button, and it just swings down and swings back up again. That really is it. I would say you get the main impact of the change of the flight deck when you get in here and just look around for yourself. It really feels like a different cockpit. It really feels like there's been quite significant changes and it really changes the atmosphere in here. Let's take a quick listen to the sounds in the flight deck. Now these were introduced on the A310 but they have been refined even more on the A300 version too. Every single one of these switch sounds is from a recording from the real aircraft taken with real professional level equipment and there's multiple different switch sounds for each switch so every time you move it you can hear that it's not the same noise playing over and over again. So let's take a listen to that and then move on to looking at the IDC and the radio panels. Okay, so what is the IDC and how do we display it? First of all, the IDC, it's a Collins FMS unit with the FMS functionality removed. So we're just using the radio tuning functionality. You can see the unit down here on the right hand side. Now, this was officially used in the Beluga, but in the Beluga, they also integrated the ILS receiver, but on the A300 and A310, you can see it's still conventionally tuned up here as you would in the A300 version 1. Now, what does this unit bring and who used it? Quite a few carriers used it. Uh, FedEx, virtually their entire fleet had this fitted, um, exactly as you see here. This is where we got a lot of the information from. And it allows you to have basically a CPDLC functionality, much more upgraded ACARS functionality, and also allows this sort of printer integration in a, in a better way. So that's why it's primarily used. And a lot of those functions are fully modeled. Now, how do you get this function in the aircraft? Because it may not always be there. So first of all, you need to come onto the settings page. We now have two options, so page one and two. So we're on page one here, and we need to go to page two. And as you can see, we have radio panel CPDLC function. We already talked about that without the IDC, you have no CPDLC functionality. If you want to know more about CPDLC and how to log in and all this sort of stuff, check the link in the description below where I talk about this in the Welcome to the A310 video. Now, if I toggle this drop down to off and then I click save, you can actually see how the whole pedestal gets reconfigured to the classic configuration. So there's quite a few little things that move around there. So I'll do that again. So at the moment, we've got the old school radio, so no CPDLC, no printer functionality. And if we turn this on and then we click save, boom, you can see we get the IDC unit down here and all the functionality is there. So let's take a look at the IDC a little bit closer for a brief overview. 
Okay, so here's the IDC. We're not gonna go over all the functionalities of the IDC because that's a very, very long topic. And it's already been covered in the Welcome to the A310 video link below, which will show you how to log on and get set up with a Hoppies account, which will be required to use this functionality. Now, what we have here is it's a digital tuning. So it's the IDC, I think it's the 900 or the 9000 units that it's actually using in the avionics bay to do a lot of the radio tuning. So some of the functionality behind this, which is quite cool, as you can see, you can have up to five pages of presets and you can see there are some already saved in here just for myself as a test. So let's say we wanted to recall the preset number two. You can simply type in PAPA2 and if I put that there, then it will recall it. But what I can also do is if I'm on the main page here, I can press that and bingo, I get my communicom frequency and I can toggle it across. You can do the same thing for a lot of the others, uh, saving presets. Nice feature. Um, depends if you fly the same route over and over again, you can kind of have them all ready there and off you go. But that functionality is persistent. So when you close the sim down, it will remember it in a custom file that it's saved into the aircraft itself so it's not per livery it's there all the time what else have we got so we've also got a pop out now and also if you click you can see you get a red border now the red border is the same as the fms and if i type then on my keyboard you can see it types inside the idc itself now this will become useful if we look at the extended features so here we have cpdlc on the left and aoc standard on the right so if we go into the cpdlc menu this is where we can log on look at the log the reports and requests and see if we're connected or not so with reports and requests you can see there's an awful lot of stuff you can ask for like i say this is all covered in the other video now one thing i want to do that's quite cool is show you the printer functionality so if we go miscellaneous messages miscellaneous reports this is where you can free text so if you um, knew someone else who was also flying and had their hoppy code in the EFB and you knew their call sign you could put their call sign in the address box and send a message directly to them and they would receive it even if they're not online and what I mean by that is as long as their aircraft is got an internet connection then they will receive the message now please use this with caution all messages are tracked publicly and it can be seen so this is not a system to be abused and also if you're receiving messages you don't want to receive simply delete the logon code from the EFB and you will not receive any more messages at all so that's an easy way to get rid of it now let's do a test so I'm gonna send a message to test because obviously that's not a real person or at least hope it's not <laughs> and I will say hi this is a test and how you type this in this is the same for most sort of functionalities you do it line by line so if I want to say test 2 if I put it here it's gonna go below but if I put it there it's also gonna go the lower down so I can click send now you can see that I have sent that message now on the ATC log if we click on it now I can click print and we can see the printer printing the message that I just sent. Now you can print out clearances, weather, whatever you want from this system. And once it's finished printing, you simply click it, you hear a tear noise and it moves to the left side here and it can act as a reminder. So if you get given your clearance, you can print it out, put it there, or even type something in free text, like in that free text box there, you can type your taxing instructions, print it out, click the button, and have it next to you so you know where you're going. If you then want to remove it, you simply hover over the X and it's gone, and that's it. So I think that's a really sort of whirlwind quick overview of the IDC and some of the functionality that it has and some of the really, really cool stuff that it brings in uh, with it. I really, really do like this feature. And you've also, just last thing I'm gonna mention, this ATC message light, this is also linked. So when you get a message from a controller, that's why that's there and it lights up and makes a noise. So I think that about covers it for the IDC and the standard radio option. Okay, so let's take a look at these new features in the EFB. So we've got landing performance, works fairly similarly to the takeoff performance. We can put the airport in, the runway, all the winds and weathers and everything like that and it will give us our factored and unfactored landing distance now what are those so factored landing distance is the landing distance that the plane's physically going to take plus 15 percent now for most airbus aircraft 
that is the landing distance you must abide by unless you're in an emergency and then you can land so long as it can physically land so if you're inside that 15 percent and it will tell you that it will give you a negative stop margin if you're not going to be able to stop and that's about it nothing too crazy about that feature but it's nice to have you can kind of work out which brake setting you're going to want to use checklist is the same ground ops remains mainly the same obviously the only difference is the loading and unloading of the cargo charts tab now what this is is this is avitab integration you will need to grab a file off the forum for avitab to be able to be integrated once you do that then as soon as you click this it will load into a familiar interface and you can have all your charts everything in there atus remains the same panel states and settings are where the two main changes are so let's start on the settings page so this is page one of two now because obviously we've got more things integrated so let's start on the top left fairly similar to the A300 version 1. We've got the units, we've got the alignment time, uh, linking the standard, linking the flight directors, linking the barometers, EFB activation window, that's the blue box around it. This is all the same and these are pretty much the same as version 1. But we have the set sim brief username, so as we mentioned with the IDC integration, this is where you will put your sim brief username and save it. The thrust reduction and acceleration altitude, RAS if you want to use it, I believe FedEx and UPS do actually use RAS on their aircraft, so it's a realistic option to have on. Pause at top of the descent, same as before, and these are the sound sliders that you can use to adjust however you want them to be without having to go into the X-plane menu. Now, this next page, remember fuel state, basically uh, when you load back in it has the same amount of fuel that you left it. So if you one of those people that like to do sort of a realistic rotation when you come back to it it's going to have the same fuel that you left it with which is quite cool the hoppy logon code self-explanatory from the a310 idc video this is where you put your logon code uh, auto save interval we're going to come back to in a second we've already gone through the cpdlc and the engine type selector now this is an interesting one so the engine type selector we can select ge or pw now we can swap them on the fly literally when we're in flight um, you can swap them and it will swap over all the sort of 3d elements in the flight deck which is quite a few that change and the sound pack and everything so there's no longer two separate aircrafts for GE and PW it's all in one and this is where you set it if you select a livery which is a General Electric or is a Pratt & Whitney it has a file associated with it so you will automatically load in to the correct engine type but you can override it if you wish um, and that's basically it, like in the A310. Now, back to the autosave interval. This is the only thing that I would like to talk about a little bit longer because it can could cause someone's problems on their flight. Now, this is however many seconds the aircraft automatically makes an autosave. So in our case, every two minutes, it remembers the state of the aircraft, writes it to a file, and that's it. You won't see I would say any performance loss from this system. Um, so don't worry about turning it off or whatever. I see people saying, how do I turn this off? Well, you could just put 99999 in there if you want, but it, it literally is not taking virtually any performance at all. You can even see it in the plugin manager. But where this can cause issues, let's say you say, oh, well, actually I want my autosave every 10 seconds. Fair enough, you can do that. But let's say you're departing or we're taxiing out the sim crashes for whatever reason you load back in now we will be greeted with this page here and we go okay I now need to go on to settings I now need to go on to the panel state sorry auto save this is the new area that we have and load last save now it's saving it every 10 seconds so if you don't do that within 10 seconds, it's going to make a new save on the stand right now and you will have lost your last autosave. So I would recommend two minutes and above, realistically. You know, maybe five minutes, just so you know that when you load in, there's no rush, you can come in, click last autosave and boom, it will take you to where you were. So that's the only caution I give you on this system. We've already got one here. I made this earlier. It stands for Victorville Stand Ch Cargo One. Um, you can make these, um, you can delete them, rename them. So I can delete this one. I can save my current state and location. It comes default with just the place, the time, and everything like this. And I can rename it to what I had before. And boom, there it is. You can set these for the 
on departure or on the ground or whatever you want and you can go back to these scenarios they're persistent so they won't go away obviously they're not shared between the cargo and the passenger because they're two separate aircraft but that's it and that's how the autosave system works i have to say it's an absolute savior of many of my flights where you know whatever happens it just closes or crashes or actually i find myself busy with things i think well i'll just close the sim i don't even think about it i just close it and go well i know it'll work and it's a very consistent system only thing to be aware of with it if you load an auto save it takes around about uh, i'd say between 15 and 20 seconds before it hands over control to you 10 of those seconds the sim is unpaused so if you're loading it say at like 100 feet on the approach it's not really going to work because it's going to effectively be out of your control for 10 seconds. The autopilot's still in and it's doing the correct thing, but you're not going to be able to physically fly it. So if you want to do landing practices, just make it a few miles out or you know whatever you want and it will work. And that is it really. Again, a bit of a quick overview because I've gone through all of this on the A310 video, which again is linked below, but I just want to introduce this to the A300 customers who may have not seen those videos so i think that's it let's move on okay so here we are holding short of the runway let's just make sure we've got all the items done for the below the line before we enter up so the cabin is secure tcas is trra packs are on ignition is continuous and engine anti-ice or anti-ice in general is definitely off today for our 44 degrees celsius takeoff so let's talk about the takeoff procedure what we're going to do we're going to go on the runway line up set 50% thrust, press the go levers. The go levers are activated by this click spot here or a click spot on the throttles. You can also bind it in the settings menu. Then we will apply half control column forward and above 80 knots, we will slowly start to release to be released by 100 knots. Then we're in the high speed regime, V1, rotate, rotate off the ground. Once we get in the air, autopilot's gonna come in quite quickly because trying to fly, look, film, do everything is quite a lot and also you might see a little bit of non-standard like autopilot in then gear up because otherwise i have to lean over and i'm flying with literally one hand so it's kind of awkward so bear with me on that one i know it's not standard but that's what we have to deal with at the moment so let us go let's have a look at the approach approach looks good a bit more breakaway thrust there we go Not going to do a tight 90 degree lineup. I was thinking about doing it, then I thought this is the second largest commercial runway in the world, one of them anyway. So, probably going to be fine <laughs> for the margins on takeoff, even at this temperature. So, let's go. Just do a nice, easy lineup. Come back to idle now. Yeah, that is a big runway. <laughs> All right, let's set 50%. And we can start the clock. That looks good. Press the go levers, thrust, SRS, runway. Thrust set. Start releasing the back pressure. Fully released now. 100 knots. Checked. V1. Rotate. Nav. All right, I'm going to cheat now. If you want, positive climb gear up, thrust. So that's now relatched as the gear's gone up. A thousand feet. 
All right. There we go. So, P thrust, P climb. Thrust is coming back to climb. And look at that out the window. You can tell, though, we're hot. And we're not heavy, right, but we're sort of heavy. Because look how shallow this sort of climb gradient is out of the valley here. Um, quite a big sort of built-up municipal area here, actually. But let's take a look at what's going on. So, flaps can come up one. And we can go all the way to flaps zero as we are above F speed. Looking good, climbing away. So now let's do our after takeoff items. Gear to neutral. Spoilers to disarm. Lights. Nose light can come off. Turn off lights can come off. And landing lights can remain on. It's looking good. And there it goes with the turn. So we're going to just monitor this little turn because, as you can see, it's quite a sharp turn. And it's just worked out, Ooh, this is going to be quite difficult, it's in nav, so it's rolled right to the 30 degree bank limit, and we want to see what it can try and do. Now this is quite a difficult turn, as you saw, it's probably a 100 120 degree turn, something like that. And I'm going to up the altitude, press the middle in to get it in thousands, and we're going to climb to flight level 360, so 36,000 is blue. So let's see how it does on this turn. Or looking at these stunning views out the window. I imagine it's probably going to overshoot. Um, the real aircraft probably would as well, uh, but let's keep an eye on it. Wind's on the nose now, so it's pretty light wind as well. Temperature's still 43 degrees Celsius. Temperature on the fuel is very hot as well. Oh, it's doing a nice job. It's doing a nice job. So now it's starting to roll out. Uh, yeah, it didn't overshoot. That did a very nice job. So it's now straight away on heading to there. Let's sync the heading up. There we go. And if you ever want to sort of see what the aircraft is doing flying-wise, press M. It brings up your map and you can see what we did there. So you can actually see it's doing sort of a nice logical turn, um, even though it's given this sort of sharp look on the ND. So that just shows you how some of the new LNAV. So let's do the after... well, in fact, let me do this. Let's go resync it again. Heading select. Heading select shown there. And now let's do the after takeoff checklist otherwise it may have started to turn towards the left so slats and flaps are attracted which they are landing gears up and neutral packs are on and altimeters because we're in the US can remain on uh, the QNH until we pass 18,000 feet okay so here we are climbing away and we're going to climb up to 324 knots and let's get some terrain on ND so we can see what's going on here how high is it? 7,500. What is it? Up to 60 miles. Yeah, 10,000. Pretty high because we're already were at two or three thousand feet when we took off, so that, that does make sense. So let's quickly talk about the flight model on the A300 version two. So it's built upon the work done on the Beluga and then the A310, but also it uses the fantastic plugin or program, more appropriately called, from Totorico, the Polar 2 AFL. And this allows you to really insert accurate airfoil data into X-Plane, and it's fantastic. And that's what's being used here. Also, the thanks to Captain Crash, one of the users uh, from the Discord there, who helped me get the most accurate information possible out of this program. And that's what we're using here for the wings and also for the tail. On top of that, the whole flight model has been rebuilt uh, from version 1 with more accuracy across the board and it kind of ends up giving you quite a bit more pitch stability so when you're flying it around it just feels a bit more confident in pitch which is which is really nice roll rates about the same uh, and landing it i have to say is very nice so it's a very small flare and the thrust just comes off at the end and if you look at some videos on youtube of real a300s landing from the cockpit there are actually a few you can see that's exactly what they they do and um, talking to the pilots who fly them who work on our team they say that's exactly how it is to land so I think we've really accurately captured that and if you do a flaps 15 20 landing it's even more so uh, but yeah really happy with how that works another very cool feature that we've got is the engines are actually fed thrust information as they climb so let's talk a little bit about the engine so we've now got custom EGT uh, fuel flow uh, oil pressure fuel pressure and all that sort of stuff so we can get the information during cranking and also allows it just to be a bit more accurate. If you swap between the Pratt & Whitney and the GEs, 
all this information swaps across as well and they're all tabulated um, inside the plugin that feeds into this. Going back to the thrust values we were saying there, the engines are fed to the thrust correction as they climb, so actually you'll end up with exactly the right amount of thrust from the engines from sea level, at toga thrust, all the way up to the service ceiling of the aircraft, and you can see it gives a much more consistent climb rate through the flight levels. You, you can see it now, we're at what, 2,300, maybe 3,000 feet per minute, and it will keep that, and there's no more sort of slowing down, it just keeps a consistent climb rate as it goes up. It's uh, overall just a really nice experience. So what I'm going to do now is climb all the way up to flight level 360 and meet you back then. Okay so you join me at the cruise for level 360. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop out the menu here, we're going to add a failure, we're going to add an engine to failure. So we're going to scroll down here, engine to fail, and we can have seconds after takeoff, feet after takeoff and above speed. So an easy way to sort of fail something straight away is to put zero seconds after takeoff. Now quite a few things are going to happen. I'm going to have to get the aircraft in a safe configuration, then we can talk about it a bit because there are some items that I need to do straight away. So there we go. So we have a master caution. That's checked. Right. Okay. It's an engine to fail. Okay. Auto thrust off. Full power. MCT. Engine out is confirmed. And let's have a look at our max cruise level. So it's 261, so let's come down to 220, set that, and set green dot there. Clear that. Right, okay, so it's secure now. We'll pop this out. Okay, my radios, ECAM actions. Engine 2 fail, that is confirmed by the Gen 2 fault light, low pressure light on the yellow system, and the associated spoilers checked. So, ignition continuous relight, throttle to idle, throttle to confirm, confirmed, idle, strange how they call them throttle, not thrust levers, but that's an A300 thing, and if no immediate relight, there's no immediate relight, the fuel lever to off, so fuel lever to, it's confirmed, off. If damage, well we have N1 and N2, no damage, clear engine 2, clear engine 2. Air HP valve fault, procedure air bleed HP valve fault, makes sense because it's associated with the engine, clear air, flight control pitch trim to fault reset, let's try and reset it, may latch, no, and hydraulic yellow system low pressure, now I know how we can solve this one, so we can turn on the electrical green pump, or pumps, there are two of them, plural, and then we can put on the PTU. Now this will clear out a lot of the ECAMs that we're gonna get because they're no longer applicable because you can see the hydraulic system booting back up, um, see the servo lights gone off and we will see all these fault lights go out momentarily as well. There we go, so a lot of these ECAMs are now redundant. So we can also try and get that pitch trim and your damper to reset back on. So we're gonna clear hydraulic because that's no longer relevant. Air, that's still relevant. Elec, Gen 2 off. So let's have a look. Elec, Gen 2 fault light. So it's going to come off. We can also see that that's happening on the ECAM SD page here. And pack 2 off as well. So let us clear electric and air. And that brings us to the status page, procedure, single engine operations, APU start up to flight level 250. So we can start the APU once we get below flight level 250, but I believe, if I'm remembering rightly, that is actually only to do with sort of an APU assisted start. I believe it's kind of a weird wording. I'm pretty confident that I can actually start it right now just for electrical supply, which is what I want because I'm only currently on one single generator. So we're descending down at a thousand feet per minute now. So now what I'm gonna take care of is the rudder trim. So you can see we've got a bit of slip. See how it's not quite holding the heading properly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to manually trim the aircraft. So let's pop that in. I know there's a lot of popping in and out of displays, but it's the easiest way for you to see it. So if I now manually trim the aircraft to the left, 
that looks a bit better maybe a bit more units of trim which is reflected here if you click reset it will fully reset it so once the autopilot's on it's fully manual with the rudder trim and then once the slats are out the autopilot will take care of it so we're in a stable configuration now actually we're pretty much overhead the airfield it's just down there to our left so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this engine started again um, by clearing the failure and then we're going to come back to do an ILS to land, standard two engine ILS. Just thought I'd show you that, just some of the failures you can do, uh, it's the same as the A310, um, quite a few in there, they're fun to practice and the whole ECAM status system works nicely. So I'll join you back on the approach. Okay, here we are on the ILS approach, runway 17 back into Victorville. Decided I'd short, uh, show you an auto land this time round. Uh, just because it's quite difficult to try and manually land the aircraft with one hand and hold the microphone and talk about it and it's cool to see the auto land system in a bit more of a challenging condition so we've got a quartering sort of six knot tailwind which is 60 percent of the maximum so 10 knots is the maximum tailwind allowed for this aircraft so it's getting up there it's obviously not the limit but it's also not the lowest we're at 42 43 degrees celsius on the ground so it's pretty warm. Um, that is getting near sort of the environmental envelope for the aircraft, so right on the edge of what the auto land would have been certified up to. And the main one is we're landing at around 3,000 feet, and the density altitude today will be, oh, I don't know, five or 6,000 feet. So it's quite a, it's not the most difficult auto land in the world, but it definitely isn't the easiest. It has a fair few factors to try and fight against because if I remember rightly, the Autoland system for the A300 is not certified up as high as the more modern Airbus types, which makes sense. So how do we do an Autoland? Well, we make sure we have both autopilots in, which we do. We make sure that we have CAT3 shown on here, which we do. You can see we have no DME, uh, but that's because there is no DME co-located, so not located with this ILS. But the DME here is coming from uh, a VOR, which is somewhere down the field. So this is pretty much our DME. And then what we expect to see is we expect to see at uh, about 400 feet above the ground, so 400 feet RA, it goes into land mode. And that means, yeah, I'm good to go with auto land. If you don't see that, it isn't going to auto land. Do a go around or continue manually if possible. Then at around about... Uh, probably 50 or 60 feet you'll see it go into flare mode, thrust will come back, we will see retard on the left column then man thrust and it will touch down. We will see flare as I said and then rollout will show after that once it lands uh, the transitions into the ground mode and it will try and track the center line again. Uh, let's see how it goes, uh, it's a little bit tricky, I will knock the order brakes off and stow the spoilers because I want to kind of roll all the way to the end of this monstrous runway. But it gives you a good look on the left hand side over here of all the aircraft parked up that we taxi passed on our way out. Cool, so here we are. I also set zero feet on the DH, but it's clearly cab okay, so it makes no difference. Expecting that land mode any moment. There's land, we've got the 400 call. You can see that crab from the quartering tailwind. It's going to maintain the three degrees soon and not follow the glide explicitly like it should do. Yep, looking good. Bit of a firm touchdown, but that's okay. Nose is coming down. Roll out, and we had flare. I'll take these out, and also I will stow these just so we can roll as far as possible. So now the autopilot's still in, it's still controlled and roll out. Bit of a firmer touchdown, but to be honest, that's what I would expect with this temperature, this altitude, and uh, that sort of subtle crosswind component. Auto lands aren't always smooth. Um, you know, the, the system here is designed for around about 110, I think, 115 foot per minute. Touchdown rate is its target. That's off the top of my head. Um, and if it comes under, it, it's not supposed to. If it goes over, it's was sort of an environmental reason that made it do that so still think that was a pretty good auto land uh, I'm gonna take the next last exit and then we will sum up the video from there so see you there 
Okay, so let's quickly look at the features coming to the A300 passenger version and then we will do an outro to the video. So, main things that are going to come to it are all the features that were in the A310. So we're going to have coming on board, cabin announcements, so these are in different languages depending on the livery and all these Smaller nice sort of things. You also get the lighting control, this can be done with the 3D panel or it can be done with the EFB depending on which one you want now. Also, you get the screens in the cabin. These show you sort of flight progress, time, weather, all this sort of stuff. But as you'll notice, the 3D is from the A300 version 1, not from the A310. There's a few reasons we did this, but the main reason is customers who were coming from the A300 version 1 to the A310 were saying, love the look of the cabin, but my computer doesn't love the look at it and I'm struggling. So we don't want customers who already owned the A300 version 1 to then get the upgrade to the version 2 and it not to be a good experience for them performance wise. So we've kept the cabin the same and also I do think it's a nice cabin. It's, you know, it's appropriately sized, we've got nice window frames and it still looks good in here with the upgrades as well to the interactive screens. Also, you've got the slides, so you can disarm and arm the slides. If you forget to, they'll blow. You can easily reset them. It's a nice little feature. I showed it off in the A310 video. Exactly the same thing is here for the A300 version 2. Also, both the freighter and the passenger have enhanced wing flex. I've run out of time to even show you that in this video, and there are many, many other features that I just haven't had time to cover, but it gives you a good taste of what's to come on this A300 version 2. So, what do I have to say for the outro? Well, I think I just want to drive home the difference between the A300 version 1 and the version 2. We've got so many new features that are above and beyond what was on the version 1. We've got CPDLC, we've got failures, we've got the IDC unit itself, we've got the printer, we've got new textures, we've got better sounds, we've got a better flight model, we've got the flight model using experimental flight model, we've got many many more things I could go on you've just listened to me do this for the last 40 or 50 minutes odd but uh, let's come to how can you get the A300 version 2 and how much will it cost well it's going to be a free upgrade for everybody and what do I mean by that I mean if you already own the A300 version 1 once the update comes out you'll just be able to update your A300 version 1 and it will become the version 2 at no extra cost if you purchase the aircraft after the version 2 is out, it will cost the same as the version 1. So it will just become the standard aircraft that we keep updating. Version 1 will no longer be supported. You'll also be able to update the product using the INI Manager. So it will be launched using the INI Manager and will be much easier to keep it up to date. Thank you very much for choosing to watch this video. I know it's very, very long. I hope you're excited as I am, and we promise that this aircraft will be coming before the end of the year. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the video.